Hello, and welcome to the virtual and in-person AWP conference and book fair. I am January Gill O'Neill, a member of the AWP Board of Directors. For accessibility, I'd like to offer a physical description of myself. I am a black woman in a blue blouse sitting in a very yellow chair. We are delighted to bring you this event today, a reading with Arthur C., Meg Day, and Kemi Alabi, sponsored by the Academy of American Poets. Our literary partners and sponsors allow AWP to present these extraordinary literary events and help us keep our conference affordable and accessible. A thank you to all our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. This event was pre-recorded and is premiering on Friday, March 25th from 1.45 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. After the conclusion of this event, it will be available for on-demand viewing. During the event's premiere, please enter your questions or comments in the platform chat box on the right of the screen. If you are watching on demand, feel free to continue to leave comments in the chat box to the right of the video. We thank you so much for attending and for your continued support of AWP. We hope you enjoy this event. Hi, I'm Jen Benka, the Executive Director of the Academy of American Poets. For those of you who don't know us, we're the nation's leading champion and funder of poets and poetry programs. We also produce poets.org. We originated National Poetry Month, which of course is celebrated every April. And we published the popular Poem A Day series among many other free programs and services. We're very happy to be partnering again with the Associated Writers and Writing Programs to present a reading by three poets whose work we admire, Kemi Alabi, Meg Day, and Arthur Z. Kemi's first full-length poetry collection, Against Heaven, was selected by Claudia Rankin to receive the 2021 Academy of American Poets First Book Award, and we're absolutely thrilled that their book will be published by Grey Wolf on April 5th, and here's a sneak peek. I hope you've seen that, Kemi, yourself. I hope I'm not the only one that has a copy. Fabulous! That's great to see. Wonderful. About Alibi's prize-winning collection, Claudia Rankin wrote in this energetic and brilliant debut, the thrust of the lyric dislodges all that is stuck and stagnant, creating new possibilities for utterance. Kemi earned their BA in philosophy and political science from Boston University and lives in Chicago. Meg Day received their MFA from Mills College and a PhD in literature and creative writing with an emphasis on disability poetics from the University of Utah. They are the author of Last Psalm at Sea Level, which won the Publishing Triangle's Audre Lorde Award and was a finalist for the Kate Tufts Discovery Award. About this book, Kazuma Lee wrote, in this writing, the poetic is political. Through this investigation, the body of the person and the body of the poem both move in new ways. Meg has received awards and fellowships from AWP, the Lambda Literary Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, among many others. And we were thrilled to have Meg as part of our Poem A Day series as a guest editor. They teach at Franklin and Marshall College and live in Pennsylvania. Arthur Z is the author of poetry collections, including recently The Glass Constellation, and also Sightlines, which received the 2019 National Book Award in Poetry. He is also a celebrated translator. His many other honors include an American Book Award, a Lannan Literary Award for Poetry, fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Jackson Poetry Prize. About Sightlines, the National Book Award judges noted that Arthur writes with a quiet mastery which generates beautiful, sensuous, inventive, and emotionally rich poems that demonstrate a keen awareness of structural, environmental, and social threats in the midst of expansive beauty. 
He was named a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a professor emeritus at the Institute of American Indian Arts and lives in Santa Fe and will be the guest editor of Poem A Day this December. Thank you, poets. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be reading to you today. It is February in Chicago and the city is covered it in snow. So this recording feels a bit like time travel to a better time. Uh, you'll, uh, uh, so I'll be reading from my debut collection, Against Heaven, and starting with a poem that feels very situated in this winter that we're in. The Lonely Sleep Through Winter. I say hunger and mean your hands bitten to bone seed, bandaged with bedsheet and the night, while two states over, a mouth, ready soil, says your name. Next June's lover speaks the harvest, your rich, vowel tender song, but for the neighbor. More hello than amen, not yet a whole book of psalms. Choose this, not your bare room, your self-vacancies. Unlearn empire's blackness. Night spun savage, space cast empty, when really a bomb slicks the split between stars. Really, hip thick spirits moonwalk across the lake ice. Maps to every heaven gauze the trees in velvet between that green bright spectacle of bud and juice and dust. I'm saying there's no such thing as nothing. Try and try, you'll never disappear. I say hunger, mean hands you think empty, though everywhere, even the dark, heaves. Chicago rapper Saba has a song I love where the chorus repeats, there's heaven all around me. And Nick Hakim, another artist I love, sings, what if heaven's right here? So this next poem is a double golden shovel using those lyrics. It's called Against Heaven. There's earth, amethyst, cherries in heat, trees drooling sugar, midnight's blue song. So what heaven, that kingdom hold, by a coy god's touch, where green and the river began. If all father tells it, first you slave and shiver and shuck and die and die for heaven's around back gate to budge loose at the bent speck of you. Lies, no doors, no lines, look right. Me and mine kissed alive, greening, Curl up and chime against us. The river is born here. This next poem is called Undelivered Message to the Sky, November 9, 2016. You were in my dream last night, Titanic falling every cop siren pocking your blue. Shots fired straight above my head by trembling men, then a hot lead rain. You still sank and all the creatures bowed except the humans. We broke the land screaming, then shattered the sound. When I woke up, I felt it, a twitching in my teeth the rumble of a nearby rapture. I opened the blinds and a pack of white women were wailing down 45th, crying into potholes, writhing in the street like worms. One saw me, wails pitched to a weapons grade. Sorry, 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 so sorry, we're sorry. And I wished Yamaya would sling an ocean out my throat. 
but all I had was English, blindfolds, trick knives, no real magic. Nothing in their language makes them disappear. That's why the guns into cages, why they cut our tongues. Because we would call and you would come. This next poem is in two parts. I wrote it at the beginning of this pandemic and I did not think it would still be relevant today. It's called Black As. First, the wound. Not all of us survived. Grief came home, back to our throats, our lungs. Grief been black, blue black. Tires balled between work and home black. Monday through Sunday, double shifts black. Asked about those visions, if spirits still slicked my mother's sleep and she said she's too tired to dream, too tired to see nothing but black. Grief came home to our lead thick water, our Big Mac breakfast greasing the way between work and home and work and home black. Begged her to take sick time, but not a day off in 10 years black. Said the place would fall apart without her, but not a raise in 10 years black. Needs the health insurance. Dad used nine diapers all before noon. Don't make pill boxes big enough black. And the copay is alone. Not all of us survive. Not all living is surviving. A virus can't take what they already stole. Our land, our labor, our language, our magic, our minds, our time, our time. But all my mother's mail tries to tell her what she owes. How much will her burial cost? Death, another debt, black. Grief, a bill where the body was, black. News, all markets and borders and shouts and nothing we can live on. No news, still bad news, black. Learned about the virus on the clock when the packages he shipped became essential. Learned about the virus when Pastor got sick, though he was covered in the blood though she made third, fourth jobs of prayer, learned about the virus when the cough came, when the clinic wouldn't answer the phone, remembered what the ER cost last time, so I just stayed home, when even the stores in the white neighborhoods had nothing on the shelves, when the calls from the cousins up in county came and even their pitch was a fever. Portal. And even their pitch was a fever, became essential. Shouts, we can live on. A bill the body owes for our magic. All living would fall apart without our black. Greasing the way between home and home grief. Our thick water spirit, vision double, shifts black, mother blue, back home. My mom calls heaven home. We have very different takes on the concept. So this next poem I wrote for her, it's called Voice Clear As. When my mom discovers heaven's just a noise festival, the God choir of all her loves breathing, 
unsnagged by asthma or Newport dragged lung. The true song life makes, untethered from a body, tugged at last from the men who hold its reins. Will she blame her pastors, like I did, for Sunday portraits of pooled white gold? Will she miss the wooden flute of her body, mourn the day's corner propped, cloaked in dust, too pious to disturb a room's skin cells and stray hair with her sound, snapped awake at the nightmare of a slip fringe, the private note sung aloud, or unburdened by hell, will she exhale and hear the bells? I'm throwing in another attempt at time travel away from this winter. So here's another poem reaching towards the next season. It's titled after the song as performed by Bill Evans. It's called, You Must Believe in Spring. Even the black grounds aching and ashy, colonized by a pasty snow, thief socking you to sleep before blaming the dark. Virus news sweeps your screens and your blue-lit mind fixes on the frozen lake, closest lover to curl inside. You would trade a skull of yes, no for quiet, two slushed thoughts per foot below. But there it goes, doing the frost of your plan. Star witness to original sin, Atlantic turned accomplice, Tongues flung overboard for charming its rise. There it goes. That same sun cupping your cheek begs, thaw. And a seed survives their winter. A lost spell buds. I have two more poems I want to read. As uh, Jen mentioned, I studied philosophy. And Descartes famously argued that the mind and body are separate. And I'm still recovering from that belief. So this poem is a wedding or what we unlearned from Descartes. Beloved, last night I doused us in good bourbon, struck a match between our teeth slid the lit head lip to chest, throat zippered open and spilling. Our union demands a sacrifice. Take my masks, my wretched, immaculate children, sharp smiles bored with cavities, braids thick with hair slashed off lovers as they slept, the masks grew limbs and danced, so last night to the fire, plank pushed, cackling as they bubbled and split, then dreamless dark, then mercy, somehow morning reached for me. Sun found us swaddled in sweat through sheets, gauze and salve while night wore off, oh body, always healing despite me. Oh body, twin spy, tasked against my plot to rush the dying, guardian of the next world's sweets. Yes, I'll lick the salt. Yes, I'll wait our turn, because today we hold hands, mother each other, bathe in warm coconut oil. Our union our long baptism. Oh body, all I forced you to know of thirst. Yes, body, you are owed a whole lake. Yes, body, I'll kiss our wrists, hold them to our ears and spend our days losing to the waves.
my last poem. During the 2020 uprisings, filmmaker Tourmaline tweeted something that has stayed with me. When we say abolish police, we also mean the cop in your head and in your heart. Thank you for listening. This is another Against Heaven. I used to pray to a man-faced God, kept his whip beneath my bed, set alarms for daybreak lashings, pressed white cotton to the flay, made flags of the blood soak, raised them from my window, called this worship, Dreamt heaven a jury, small as a county, where nobody looked like me. Winged bailiffs plucked my cuffs to trap my cousin in a hot coal cage. Called this roulette freedom, licking my raw wrists. Which kill blew my tatters down, peeled me to the blackest jade remothered me to the squad car blaze, loot and shard my siblings now, which kill? Forgive me, I feared the devil's prison, misfaith the sheriff in the sky, why, which kill? Forgive me, family, I'm miscountried, our swarming anthem of my true homeland. Heaven and hell are the same empire Half slipped, gasping, clutching our hems, ungoverned by the lie, with fists and flames, we cleave. Uh, Kemi, I can't wait for your book. Um, Thank you so much to the Academy of American Poets, um, to Jen and to Nikkei and to Colleen too for welcoming us uh, and for honoring the fact that being in person isn't yet safe for us uh, and for our disabled community and for our community of folks who can't be vaccinated, including children under five. Uh, thank you to the ASL interpreters being here today um, and to AWP for providing access. Thank you especially to Kemi for a beautiful reading um, and to Arthur, both of you for letting me join you this morning. Uh, it's such a lucky thing. Um, queer and trans folks are on my mind today uh, in Texas, in Florida, in Arizona and Alabama and Indiana and Kentucky and Oklahoma and New Hampshire and South Dakota and other states that uh, have so far introduced 2022 legislation that endangers our lives. Um, I'm thinking of Ukraine and Haiti and Palestine and how war is, uh, among other things, among many things, a mass disabling event. Um, the poems that I'll read today are from my next manuscript, which seeks to unburden itself of non-disabled and hearing expectations. I spent much of my coming up as a poet trying to uh, conform, oddly, uh, trying to assimilate as a queer and trans deaf poet writing in English. I was taught only to anticipate hearing readers and hearing audience members and to, in many ways, um, reassure gender normative readers, uh, which encouraged me to prioritize a relationship with sound and with embodiment uh, that isn't all that intrinsic to my experience as a person or my practice as a poet. Um, so I've been trying to unlearn a lot of things uh, and there is such unrest in the world. And some of these poems track that unlearning uh, and that unrest, and some of them are a result of, or maybe benchmarks uh, that mark where I've been and how far I've come. Uh, 
and how far I've yet to go. <laughs> this first poem takes its title from uh, a print of hands, a series of prints of hands by uh, the artist Louise Bourgeois. It's called 10 a.m. is when you come to me. In some other life, I can hear you breathing, a pale sound like running fingers through tangled hair. I dreamt again of swimming in the quarry and surfaced here when you called for me in a voice only my sleeping self could know. Now the dapple of the aspen respires on the wool and the shades cut its song a staff of light. Leave me, that me, in bed with the woman who said all the sounds for pleasure were made with vowels I couldn't hear. Keep me instead with this small sun that sips at the sky blue hem of our sheets, then dips and reappears, a drowsy penny in the belt of Venus, your aureole nodding slow and copper as it bobs against cotton in cornflower or clay. What a waste the groan of the mattress must be. When you backstroke into me and pull the night up over our heads, your eyes are two moons I float beneath. And my lungs fill with a wet hum, your hips return. It's Sunday, or so you say, with both hands on my chest. And hot breath is the only hymn whose refrain we can recall. And then you reach for me, like I could have been another man. You make me sing without a sound. Portrait of my gender as inaudible. I knew I was a god when you could not agree on my name, and still none you spoke could force me to listen closer. Is this the nothing the antelope felt when Adam lit on his own entitling dubbed family genus species? So many descendants became doctors delivered babies, bestowed bodies, names, as if to say it is to make it so. Can it be a comfort between us, the fact of my creation? I was made in the image of a thing without an image. And silence too is your invention. Who prays for a God except to appear with answers, but never a body, a voice? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me because I was the one to say it. On the first day, there was no sound worth mentioning. If I too am a conductor of air, the only praise I know is in stereo. One pair, an open hand and closed fist will have to do. I made a photograph of my name. There was a shadow in a field and I put my shadow in it. You can't hear me, but I'm there. One thing I've been experimenting with is trying to figure out what, what deaf sonics really means, or what deaf sound is. And I've been looking to uh, the pastoral for help. <laughs> uh, what does it mean to engage quietude? What does it mean to engage um, calm and silence and other things that hearing poets often uh, load up the idea of deafness with. Um, and so this is one of those experiments. It's called September. Harder to say now which way it moved and only that it idled at the green light of my body, high beam staring steady at the sensor and my skin that lit up like go. Hard to say if there was sun at all or just the thought of you, as afternoon leaned my shadow right, then left me in the shade. Mercy lay me down last night, and morning came anyway. Sorrow stripped me green from sleep to keep my one eye open. I stayed right here, despite the drive, and even dreamt of stillness, a sundial in snow. I left you last night, the way a station leaves a train. I left the light on anyway. I want you to understand what your sound does to me. So I take you to the field and scream. I scream the rooting pig from its soft earth, nose covered in dirt. I scream the shade from the grazing horse 
among the trees. I scream the dead rabbit out its resting place and I scream the vulture back from the sky. When it lands, I scream the grass quiet, every blade. Each deep burrow evacuates its snakes and beetles, its litters of kits. I scream my incision sites blurry with reverb. I shake with it until you become too many for me to field alone. And then I scream harder until you are one again and smaller, single and still. I scream the ground wet beneath us. My scream pulls the squirrel from its branch and the raccoon from its upright hollow and the stray pricks its ears but keeps moving. I scream until I have a tail. I scream my own tail curled. Scream so heavy it shifts the block on my chest a full inch, scraping, leaving marks. I scream the kindness from your face. It slides slowly to the left and goes all the way around before returning to my scream, still hung there in the air like a smell between us, like a soured, outdated name, like a yellow jacket you anger by trying to wave away. I'll read just two more poems. This next one is called In Line to Vote on Our Future Climate. Years from now, after the ice caps and the asteroid, after the stars have died and we receive word of their passing, but before the melting point has sung some lullaby of mercury always tugging closer that sun we did not know to fear. After the heat has become so rote, we cannot recreate, much less recollect the feeling of cool or of breeze and even stones quit carrying any memory of chill. I will think of your body cracked open at the center like the surface of the Susquehanna in deep December, the cool field of your thigh against my cheek, the creak of me sprung cold from sleep. I will keep for myself the moment before all this, the sand and the wasteland it made of us. The day we woke and green in all its iterations had abandoned us and with it the earth. After the famine, but before the drought, when you fed my wet breath into the hot terrarium of you still chilled at the edges by less natural disasters. Like the neighbor boy who told you where in the snow you should put your bare hand and for how long you should leave it. How it was returned to you, still fixed to your own, but so cold it nearly boiled, so blue it was ablaze. Um, I started with a love poem and I'm going to end with a love poem, a queer trans death love poem. Um, and this poem is after a line by Nikki Finney, uh, who was maybe one of the first poets that I read uh, as a younger person um, that helped me be less afraid. Um, and this poem is called It Must Still Be Summer. Thank you so much for watching today. It must still be summer because the tent goes up easy in the blue grass and we loiter past sundown without sleeves. The sunset, one thing we can watch that won't require captioning and isn't each other. What did you say then, hand cupped to my ear as if it would send more than winter across my arm? What did I believe I knew of language in that moment before everything about me became true? I followed you into the dark like a vowel, a train disappearing into a tunnel, a tunnel at the end of a light. It's night in the tent and my eyes can't help but deny my ears. So it's my hands that go dowsing for sound. The push broom sweep of our sleeping bags and the hourglass sand of their slow unzip. I catch your lip in the gold leaf glare of your neighbor's third shift headlights, wet road rumble in my hips and yellow symbol flashbang through your hair. I don't care how it happened, only that it did. One minute, an eternity with you, tracing the bones of my face with your read-along finger, mouthing me out, quiet, 
common mispronunciation I still let slide between my thighs at the right octave. Another, and you are old wicker, flank, soft muzzle in my palm. What makes a woman who is barely a woman move like this? What secret grammar do you know? I feed apple fingers past eager lips, smacking on 13 plus one, the heat of you sucking at the M of my name sign, my Girl Scout promise. What part of your body isn't saying my name? Say it again, say it louder. This is the last night of my life when hands remain only one kind of mouth. Whose tongue is this and where did you learn it? What made you invent a new chord and made me play it like a siren for a three alarm fire, summon new gods with their good names, hot at the reed of my jaw, like some kind of symphony disarmed of melody? All these questions and the answer right there at the end of my arm. What a great pleasure it is to be here today to read with Kemi and Meg. And I also want to thank the entire staff of the Academy of American Poets for all that they do. I'm going to start by making a few remarks. The poems I'm reading are from the Glass Constellation. And you're going to hear, see a vision of China in the mid 1980s. There's a poem in the voice of Salt. There's another poem in memory of the poet C.D. Wright. I want to make all my remarks up front here and then read the poems consecutively without comment because I've chosen them to be in conversation with each other. Winter Stars. You will never forget corpses wrapped in flames at dusk. You watched a congregation of crows gather in the orchard and sway on branches. In the dawn light, a rabbit moves and stops, moves and stops along the grass. And as you pull a newspaper out of a box, glance at the headlines, you feel the dew on grass as the gleam of fading stars. Yesterday, you met a body shop owner whose father was arrested, imprisoned, and tortured in Chile. Heard how men were scalded to death in boiling water. And as the angle of sunlight shifts, you feel a seasonal tilt into winter with its expanse of stars. Candles flickering down the Ganges where you light a candle on a leaf and set it flickering downstream into darkness. Dozens of tiny flames flickering into darkness. Then you gaze at fires erupting along the shore. The negative. A man hauling coal in the street is stilled forever. Inside a temple, instead of light, a slow shudder lets the darkness in. I see a rat turn a corner running from a man with a chair trying to smash it. See people sleeping at midnight in a Wuhan street on bamboo beds. A dead pig floating, bloated on water. I see a photograph of a son smiling who two years ago fell off a cliff. And his photograph is in each room of the apartment. I meet a woman who had smallpox as a child, was abandoned by her mother, but who lived, now has two daughters, a son, a son-in-law. They live in three rooms and watch a colored television. I see a man in blue work clothes whose father was a peasant who joined the Communist Party early, 
but by the time of the Cultural Revolution had risen in rank and become a target of the Red Guards. I see a woman who tried to kill herself with an acupuncture needle, but instead hit a vital point and cured her chronic asthma. A Chinese poet argues that the fundamental difference between East and West is that in the East, an individual does not believe himself in control of his fate, but yields to it. As a negative reverses light and dark, these words are prose accounts of personal tragedy becoming metaphor. An emulsion of silver salts sensitive to light. Laughter in the underground bomb shelter converted into a movie theater. Lovers in the Summer Palace Park. Sleepers. A black-chinned hummingbird lands on a metal wire and rests for five seconds. For five seconds, a pianist lowers his head and rests his hands on the keys. A man bathes where irrigation water forms a pool before it drains into the river. A mechanic untwists a plug and engine oil drains into a bucket for five seconds. I smell peppermint through an open window, recall where a wild leaf grazed your skin. Here touch comes before sight, holding you. I recall across a canal, the sounds of men laying cuttlefish on ice at first light. Before first light, physical contact or hearts beating, patter of female rain on the roof. As the hummingbird whirs out of sight, the gears of a clock mesh at varying speeds. We hear a series of ostinato notes and are not tied to our body's weight on earth. Salt song. Zunis make shrines on the way to a lake where I emerge. And Miwoks gather me out of pools along the Pacific. The cheetah thirsts for me. And when you sprinkle me on ribeye, you have no idea how I balance silence with thunder in crystal. You dream of butterfly hunting in Madagascar, spelunking through caves echoing with dripping stalactites, and you don't see how I yearn to shimmer an orange aurora against flame. Look at me in your hand. In Egypt, I scrub the bodies of kings and queens. In Pakistan, I zigzag upward through 26 miles of tunnels before drawing my first breath in sunlight. If you heat a kiln to 2,380 degrees and scatter me inside, I vaporize and bond with clay. In this unseen moment, a potter prays because my pattern is out of his hands. And when I touch your lips, you salivate. And when I dissolve on your tongue, your hair rises. Ozone unlocks. A single stroke of lightning sizzles to earth. Transfigurations. Though neither you nor I saw flowering pistachio trees in the hanging gardens of Babylon, though neither you nor I saw the Tigris River stained with ink, though we never heard a pistachio shell de hiss, we have taken turns holding a panda as it munched on bamboo leaves, and I know that rustle now.
I have awakened beside you and inhaled August sunlight in your hair. I have listened to the scroll and unscroll of your breath. Dolphins arc along the surface between white-capped waves. Here, years after we sifted yarrow and red from the Book of Changes, I mark the dissolving hues in the west as the sky brightens above overhanging willows. The panda fidgets as it pushes a stalk farther into its mouth. We step into a clearing with budding chanterelles. And though this space shrinks and is obscured in the traffic of a day, here is the anchor I drop into the depths of teal water. I gaze deeply at the panda's black patches around its eyes. How did it evolve from carnivore to eater of bamboo? So many transfigurations I will never fathom. The arc of our lives is a brightening, then dimming. Brightening, then dimming. A woman catches fireflies in an orchard with a swish of a net. I pick an open-mouthed pistachio from a bowl and crack it apart. A hint of a serious spills into the alluvial fan of sunlight. I read spring in autumn in the scroll of your breath, though neither you nor I saw the completion of the Great Wall. I wake to the unrepeatable contour of this breath. Vectors. First extinction in the Galapagos Islands, the least vermilion flycatcher. Hopis drill a foot deep and plant blue corn along a wash. Danger, a woman brushed on the side of a napalm bomb. In an oblong box emptied of firewood, a black widow web. Shaving, he nicked himself and stared in the mirror in a moment of blood. Out of a saddlebag, a teen pulls a severed goat's head. Before signing his name, he recalls hotel rooms were once used as torture chambers. In Thessaloniki, the beach attendant made a gun of his hand and fired at him. Prisoners cackled when the inmate on stage said, Is it not time for my painkiller? Weighing mushrooms, the Tibetan cashier grins. You suffer from suspicion. I suffer from kindness. A mercenary turned car mechanic spilled a pile of Krugerrands onto the table. Looking up from a tusk under the lamp, the carver smiled, it's butter in my hands. Dawn Redwood. Early morning light, a young red-tailed hawk glided over to early morning light, a young red-tailed hawk glided onto an overhead branch and peered down at me, but it did not look with your eyes. A battered and rusted pickup lies in the wash. Navajo tea buds on the trail. I headed back and checked in the boiler room, the traps baited with peanut butter. Now a gnat flits against the slit screen. Where are you now? One morning we walked in a Rhode Island cemetery and did not look at a single gravestone. We looked at hundred year old copper beaches, cells burnished purple, 
soaking up sunshine, and talked about the dawn redwood, how the glimmering light at the beginning of the world was in all things. This morning, in the pre-dawn darkness, Orion angled in the eastern sky with Sirius low above the ridgeline, and before daylight blotted out the stars, I heard you speak. The scratched words returned to their sleeves. Transpirations. Leafing branches of a backyard plum. Branches of water on a dissolving ice sheet. Chatter of magpies when you approach. Lilacs lean over the road, weighted with purple blossoms. Then the noon sun shimmers the grasses. You ride the surge into summer. Smell of pinyon crackling in the fireplace. Blued notes of a saxophone in the air. Not by sand running through an hourglass, but by our bodies igniting. Passing in the form of vapors from a living body. This world of orange sunlight and wildfire haze. World of iron filings pulled toward magnetic south and north. Pool of quicksilver when you bend to tie your shoes. Standing, you well up with glistening eyes. Have you lived with utmost care? Have you articulated emotions like the edges of leaves? Adjusting your breath to the seasonal rhythm of grasses. Gazing into a lake on a salt flat and drinking in reflection the Milky Way. Thank you.